Hey, hi everybody. I'm super excited because I'm talking to someone I've long admired. Hi everyone. Um, hi John. Hi, you want to listen to my Instagram live? Sure. Um, I'm about to interview Sharon Stone, everybody. Are you a Sharon Stone fan? I know I am. John Molnar, my husband, is a Sharon Stone fan and uh, we're re really excited because Sharon's written a memoir. I don't know if you all know about it, but it's called The Beauty of Living Twice. She's a big Instagram user, and so she and I have gotten sort of to reacquainted and gotten to know each other again on Instagram. I did one of the first interviews with Sharon after she had a terrible uh, situation, which she's going to tell us about, where she had a brain bleed. Uh, she had a stroke. It was incredibly scary. Molnar, someone said hi to you. Hi. Um, anyway, so I'm excited to... Is this... That's not Sharon. Okay, hold on. We're trying to figure this out. Don't worry, everybody. Hi. Um, here, can't you just go like this? And what's, what's Sharon under? She She's logging on now. Okay, she's logging on now. So I usually look for her here. Yeah. Right? Um, anyway, if you guys have any questions for Sharon, um, her book is doing really, really well. It's on the New York Times uh, bestseller list, and it basically has gotten great reviews. I'm going to read one. In spiky, reflective, nonlinear prose, she writes about basic instinct and, yes, the lake crossing thing, which she says was shot without her knowledge, although she consented to it later by not bringing an injunction against the her near-death experience in 2001 when she had a serious stroke and underwent seven hours of brain surgery. I'm quoting, Sharon Stone declined. What the heck? Sharon, don't decline me. Um, uh, her upbringing in rural Pennsylvania and the exploitative gender politics of Hollywood before Me Too. She were also, anyway, so she has uh, really been very honest. Hi, everybody, about, I don't know, what? Hi, Sharon. Hi. I didn't oh. plan you. I'm just stupid. I mean, I'm stupid technologically. What can I say? I'm Have you, you've gotten the hang of these uh, Instagram lives, right? No. You know, I, I have only done one, and I did it by accident when my friend DJ Nice called me in the middle of one of his Instagram conferences and I was sitting in the semi-darkness in my living room and the phone rang and I was like, Wah! <laughs> one of the dance parties? So you, he, you, you basically, he, you joined him. I joined him. He was talking to a couple of music legends and I was kind of like, what? And then I was talking to these incredibly so much cooler than me people on the phone and i was just sh shocked and thrilled and you know of course sitting there in the dark with you know alfalfa hair as usual and i was like wow it was like jimmy jams and like you know these really incredibly talented music people it was thrilling frankly really well i'm very happy to be your second official instagram live sharon and Really excited to talk to you about your book, which- um, I'm very excited to talk to you, Katie. I watch your Instagrams constantly, and I feel like you're like my political, uh, I feel like I'm your political student. <laughs> well, I try to use it as um, you know a way to help educate people if I can and explain issues. Like I just re-ran a piece I did on the Armenian genocide because- uh, Joe Biden talked about it, but, you know, we get so much information so fast and furious, and we're just kind of drowning in a tsunami of information that I try to take a moment and help people understand the world. So, but we're here to talk about your book. And um, first of all, it's been so well received. You must be so, I mean, it's so hard. You put yourself out there. You're so vulnerable. It's gotten great reviews. Um, I know that you've been uh, talking about it in, on different outlets. And first of all, I mean, are you feeling this wonderful sense of relief because you really poured your heart out on the page? And how scary was that, Sharon? Terrifying. It was terrifying. Um, at first, uh, you know, when you do a movie, 
I, I would have to use this sort of, it, there's a comparative analysis for me because, you know, when you do a movie, it takes so long for it to come out. It can take a year or two for a film to come out. And there's post-production and looping and advertising and all kinds of stuff you do before it ever comes out. And then it's very different, you know, because you're playing another character. Writing this book, which is a very, very personal memoir, um, you know, I was alone in my room <laughs> writing my alone book. And then I recorded the audio version. And of course, because of COVID, once again, I was alone in my room recording this book. And then it came out really quickly, really quickly, like almost instantly. And then, you know, no one talked to me about the PR or anything because I'm sure I've done a million PR gigs and but I was always talking about another character a film a project not myself personally and such profound personal experiences so the first couple of weeks were extraordinarily difficult um, and I actually took a break for a couple of weeks so that I could The, talking about the book was not only a little bit startling and like me, but also everybody that was reading it had emotions about it, like personal emotions about it, personal thoughts and feelings. And I had to be prepared to understand and relate to them personally about these very tender things. And I wanted to be ready to talk to them very personally and um, with both feet really on the ground. And as you know, we're all so alone during COVID. And, you know, even if- Were you all by your, were you all alone? Were you by yourself during this whole period? Well, yeah, I mean, I have three kids, but they're three pubescent boys who are, you know, they're all in puberty. They're all two in high school, one in college. And they're not really interested in hanging out with me. You know, that's yeah. not the period when they want to be with mom. You know, that's the period where they want to be on video games with all their friends. They want to be playing with each other. That's not the time they really want to nestle into mom. They want to be here. They want you to never, ever, ever leave the house. But they don't want to spend time with you. So yes, I was very alone during COVID. And so what, tell me about the writing process. I mean, would you write for a certain amount of time in the morning? Would you write all day? Um, would you have to take a break? Tell me a little bit of how you did this. Cause you know, I just finished writing a memoir that's coming out in the fall and I spent three, I spent three years really uh, excavating my past and going through boxes and rewatching interviews and I'm, Really curious about the process. Well, then you know, it's, you, you re, you re-experience a lot of things. And it's a very um, intellectually provocative experience, but it's also a very emotionally provocative experience. Um, and because I have kids, and because I have also my other work, um, I usually write at night. I usually try to wait till I get most of them in bed. Um, so it's usually between like 10 and two, four o'clock in the morning. Really? That wow. I write. So sometimes I sit down and start writing at 10 and I write till two, three, four. Sometimes I write till dawn. Um, and then I try to get a few hours sleep till, I don't know, 10 or 11, because my kids no longer really need me in the morning. Yeah. And then I get up and get with my work day again. And so it was sort of like my side hustle or my night hustle or whatever. Yeah. Um, I've been writing short stories in high school and some of my short stories had been published. So I had those to look through because while many of them are fiction, I had written quite a few things about my family life and my upbringing and 
an, you know, an ode to my dad and poetry and different things that were reminiscent of those times. So I had those to look to, which was really helpful. I know um, you, it, the book is called, uh, as I said, The Beauty of Living Twice. And I was mentioning that I interviewed you in 2001, I think in 2002 in your home after you had had this near-death experience and you write so evocatively and, and recapture that moment. Was it, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what happened to you, Sharon, um, and, and, and what it was like kind of reconstructing those scenes because they were so harrowing and, you know, that was a while ago. So was that tiff, tough to relive and to really remember? What was, what's been wonderful about the process is that I, I have regained, you know, so much of my memory now. And um, it gave me an opportunity to be able to connect a lot of the dots for me. Um, I still have outstanding things. Like, just for example, you now saying, you know, I came to your home and I interviewed you. I was like, oh, <laughs> I did. And then I have to like work back to remember this happening because there's so many of things during that period that are still hazy for me. Um, you know, it's really, it's really tough because my brain bleed was insidious. Um, <clears throat> it began uh, and then I had this massive, massive stroke and um, you were how old again, Sharon? I was 41, I think, 41, almost, yeah, almost 42. And I was at home and I had a, this very traumatic event. Uh, and I'm still quite unsure about how it actually transpired. Um, and I found myself on the floor in our TV room. And one couch was, you know, slid across the floor. The coffee table was across the floor. All the contents of the coffee table were all over the floor. The phone was uh, off the hook. And I sort of came to, and I knew that I was having a stroke. I could tell that I was having a stroke because I was having that kind of dysphoric, um, detached consciousness. Um, and I knew I needed an ambulance, uh, which I tried to get, but was unable to, to functionally have happen. Um, eventually, I somehow managed to get up. I told the nanny that I had such excruciating pain in my head. And she told me to take an aspirin, <clears throat> which I did, thankfully, which I think really helped me. Um, and I tried to drive myself to the hospital. And I got in the car and I got to a stop sign <clears throat> and my legs started to go numb. And this was right after 9-11. And in my mind, I didn't know what was happening because I was com becoming so um, mentally disconnected because of the brain bleed. And I thought that there was anthrax in the trees. And I started crying. I was sitting at the stop sign crying and I didn't know where I was and I didn't know what was happening. And a car pulled up beside me and recognized me. And I remember saying, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening, help me. And they had me follow them to my house and drop me off. Um, Not take you to the hospital. No. And so I went back inside and I, I just couldn't get warm. Um, and it took three days for me to get to the hospital. Eventually, I had sort of lost reasonable consciousness and uh, I was laying on the floor and my best friend called and I was so screwed up and she insisted that I get to the hospital. And so 
I was taken to um, the hospital. There's a hospital right down the street from where I lived. And when I got to the hospital, uh, the orderly and my gynecologist were standing on the street. And when the orderly opened the door, I remember seeing him standing in the street. I specifically remember seeing my gynecologist and she nodded at me and I knew that I would be okay. And the orderly opened the door and I just let go. And I remember that feeling of, okay, it'll be okay. And I remember I passed out and I fell upside down out of the, out of the truck and he got me. And then I came to and I had had a CAT scan. And when I got, I came to when I was out of that CAT scan machine and the doctor was standing over me in an empty room as I came to and he was stroking my hair. And I looked at him and I could see to look at him that something was tragically wrong. You're really lucky. I mean, Sharon, it's, it's sort of, it, it must have been a slow bleed because, you know, it was days before you got medical attention. And it then nine days before they stopped the bleed because they, the first, the first uh, look, I had been laying on one side because I had had a massive tumor in my left breast and, a breast. and my breast was still wrapped from the surgery. So I had been cradling myself on one side. And so the blood had pooled to my left side and the, the bleed and the tear was on my right side. So when they had gone in to look at the pooling blood, they had missed the tear because they had gone in where they saw the pooling blood. Mm. And no one had told them that I had had this breast surgery and I didn't get a full physical because they were just trying to attend to the incident, I guess. And so I still didn't get a full physical. And so I was laying bleeding the whole time and they said that they were gonna send me home. They thought I was faking it. And my best friend, again, saved my life for the second time and said, uh, nobody fakes being unconscious all day. Uh, so they agreed to give me a second angiogram. And when they did, they found that my left vertebral artery, you know, when um, Christopher Reeves had his accident, what happened to him is that both vertebral arteries were ruptured. That's how he became paralyzed. In my case, I ruptured one. And it was hanging to a thread when they finally noticed what was happening nine days in when, when my friend said, you're not releasing her, she's, she's dying. And so they hesitantly agreed to do another angiogram on the other side. It's interesting because, you know, you talk about how the medical establishment treated you. Mm -hmm. And, it, uh, you know, there's something called the VIP effect, uh, which, which experts have written about, where doctors often make the wrong decisions because they worry and they question their own judgment and doubt, you know, and, and, and I'm curious, can you talk about sort of your experience with the medical establishment and the doctor that had already talked to People Magazine uh, when you are in the hospital trying to, you know, on, well, on the verge of dying? I went through three years of this with my gallbladder where they told me that I was an actress <laughs> acting <laughs> like I had these unbelievable, intense uh, gallbladder pains, which is kind of hilarious because I had them forever. Like the reason I was sitting with my arms like this in Basic Instinct is because I couldn't put my arm down because my rib would sit on my gallbladder and the pain was so intense. And it went on for years and years and years. And I kept going to the same stupid doctor who kept inviting me to like go with his family to dinner, go with his kid to show and tell, but would never give me proper medical care. 
That's and weird. It's almost the opposite of the VIP effect. You were treated like you were a hysterical woman or, you know, kind of being dramatic, literally. Really mostly what I would get in life. You're being dramatic. You're a dra dramatic. You are crazy. You're an hysterical woman. And I would literally go into these offices and be sitting like, this and sobbing and saying, I, I can't, I can't, I can't go on laying on the floor in the fetal position. And eventually my gallbladder was grown to my stomach, my kidneys, my back. And it was a horrible operation to get it out. And but, but because I was young and blonde and thin, people were like, no, it can't, you can't be having that even though it was a family history issue, even though my sister had the same thing. No, I was just an hysterical woman. And yes, I think between being a VIP and being a woman and being an actress, all of my medical ailments have been told to me that I was just, you know, she's like that. She's just like that. She's just always like that. And I nearly died from both of these ailments. And, <laughs> you know, I think now, I, you know, medicine wasn't studied on the female anatomy until this century, this very century that we're barely into. And so in many, many cases, people didn't realize what was going on with women in general. Right. I talk about, I wrote about Bernadine Healy and how she really changed things for women with the women's, the, the nurses study, because so many things like heart disease has been, they've been studied on men, but of course they had very little data on, for example, heart attacks in postmenopausal women, which is the number one killer of women, you know, postmenopause. And so, you know, I, I do think that the, the medical, uh, the medical establishment has changed since you experienced this. It's, um, do you feel, do you feel that's the case? I feel it's changing. And I can yeah. tell you that since my books come out, when I, I went recently for a very simple thing uh, over to UCLA and the kindness and thoughtfulness which I received was remarkably different. It wasn't like, well, gee, that's not happening. Yeah. Gee, that, that isn't going on. How did, how did, how did the near death experience Sharon change you? You know, it, it, you're the beauty of living twice. I mean, do you look at your life before, I know you do in this book before and after and, and how is it, how would you describe the difference having experienced something like this and how it altered the way you live or the way you feel or your attitudes toward different things? I took a very hard question for me personally. Why, why did this trauma happen to me? Why? What part of it is my responsibility? What part of it is, is from my own life? I really wanted to, I just thought that the, the assignment, you know, when I, when I went to Knopf, when people were approaching me, will you write a memoir? Um, the assignment itself was a little bit not really my style. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very private about the things that I do. I'm very private about my family and my work and my life. And you're shy and you're a loner and you're <laughs> yeah. introverted, which is so interesting to me for someone, you know, I mean, not that surprising, but you wouldn't necessarily think that of somebody who cho chose the field you chose to pursue. Right. But there are a lot of people like that in my business. That's Look at, look at Bob De Niro. He's the shyest person alive, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, for me, I thought if I'm going to do this, I want to, I want it to be about something true and I want it to be about something valuable. So I'm going to ask myself the hardest question that I have, um, which is sort of very much the way I pursue the characters that I play. I want them to look at, I want to play them from the most difficult, dangerous possible perspective. And so I wanted to ask myself the most difficult, dangerous question. Why did this happen to me? And so I wanted to really explore my life from birth, 
my choices, other people's choices, and see well, how does this happen? And I learn a lot about myself and I learn a lot about just how the world responds to women and how the world responds just to each other, how the world responds to different subjects, how the world responds to with and without empathy. And for me, I feel that there are things left to be legislated and considered in a more thoughtful way. You, um, a lot of people had some questions and I, I, I'm curious as a, you know, as somebody who I interviewed, gosh, uh, almost 20 years ago, Sharon, <laughs> how, how the industry has changed. And you, of course, are, are uh, you know, you're 63, I'm 64. And it's an interesting time of life. And I would think, yeah, I would think that that Hollywood would be a special, listen, I don't think society is, is particularly kind uh, to women as they age, but I would imagine Hollywood must feel like a very brutal place where I, you know, although, you know, you see Frances McDormand in Nomadland, you see uh, some films embracing women, but they still seem few and far between. Are things starting to shift in your view? You know, I've, um, I've decided to address it a little differently personally, um, because what I really do see is that Frances McDormand not only did No Man Land, she did it with a beautiful female director who brought in global experience. And she did it with a lot of other women and that's the film that won the Oscar. So what I experienced from that is that what people really wanna see are human stories. What people really wanna see are women's perspective in the real world. And so however the industry wants to do what they wanna do, this is what human beings want to see. And my feeling about the industry is that it needs to catch up with the consumer and that the issues that are happening in the industry is because the industry has had deaf ears to what human beings are interested in. And they're trying to promote what they're interested in because they think that these tentpole movies right. are the only way that they're going to make any money. Or and rely on the same old formulas because there's a lot of fear and people don't want to take chances and take risks. And I imagine that is really frustrating as an artist and as someone who understands that people want to see their own lives reflected in the stories that they're watching. And, and you know, I, I know you talk in the book about a former manager saying no one would hire you because you weren't effable. <laughs> and, and, and that you, an unnamed director who made life on the set very difficult because you wouldn't sit in his lap and take direction. I mean, do you think those days are over? Don't you think Me Too has really kind of put people on notice and they don't want to risk ruining their careers? Uh, for that, you know, by doing that kind of behavior? You know, for me, it's not just about me too and my business. I mean, you know, we've had, we had the sixties, okay? We had the seventies, all right? We've had all of these things and black people still have to march in the streets in order to be thought of as a whole human being. You know, we've had sexual revolutions, you know, the 80s and 90s were certainly the biggest sexual revolutions of all times. And yet we still have these issues. These issues don't start and end in Hollywood in power people's offices. They start and end in the home. And to me, none of these things are really ever going to be conquered until we conquer them in the home and in the legal system, where we really have people in homes and in schools and available to every kid on the planet that this 
just can't happen without some oversight, that there's someone to talk to, someone to tell, and somehow to get healing. And laws, laws, felonies and misdemeanors about all of these things. And that, you know, this idea of the way we redline people, the way we redline communities for people of color, and the way that we redline women out of their rights, and the way we treat um, people uh, indigenous people, the way we treat um, immigrant people who come here to work. Um, you know, my family were Irish immigrants. And, you know, when my mother was a young girl, uh, no dogs, no Irish were signs in the windows. And, you know, we forget all of these things so quickly, so with such um, this sort of grandeur of billboards and advertising, we forget how we treat one another in the common day. And Me Too can't just stop because it was a great PR movement. Where are the laws? Two people went to jail, Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby. That doesn't really settle it. That Let me fix it. Yeah. Um, I know that you don't have a lot of time, but we got a lot of questions from our followers and I want to, I want to pose some of them to you. Somebody asked if you could trade all of your roles for one you never had a chance to play. You know, what's the one that got away, Sharon? It's going to sound sort of stupid, but I always Wait, wait, I couldn't hear that. I said, I think it's going to sort of sound stupid now uh, because it's too late. But when I was a younger person, I always wanted to play Hamlet. Uh, you know, there were actresses in, you know, older times that played this part. And I always thought it was a very intriguing part for a woman to have an opportunity to take a stab out. Because certainly in Shakespearean times, uh, for so long, men played all the women's parts. And I just thought that that was of such an interesting part and something that uh, carried so many things that women part very rarely ever get a chance to look at. That might be interesting to feminize Hamlet and make all the fem uh, male char characters female and the female characters male. Well, I think it was Sarah Bernhardt played it when she was a young actress and mm -hmm. actresses have played it. But All right, here, here, okay. Is there anything else that you like, could tell us that you auditioned for and you didn't get and you were just so mad? Um, no, there are films that were made that I thought, oh, Boy, I would have liked to have had a stab at that. Like what? Oh, I don't want to do that because I think that's not fair to the actresses who did it. Because I'm well, sure. Well, no, they, but that doesn't. I mean, they I, did it, so. Um, but I do think that um, the structure of agencies that you don't often even get the parts that are offered to you. They all come in, they go in a big heap, and then the agency decides that maybe someone else in the agency might be better for the part that came in for you. Um, so I don't have an agent right now because I sort of decided that if someone wants me for a part, they'll probably call me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they don't need to do all those shenanigans. And I also probably don't need the stress of being told you're too tall, shoot, too thin, too fat, too whatever, too old, too young. I probably don't need that in my life anymore. It's probably not the healthiest thing for me the healthier thing would probably be to allow, you know, the producers and directors that find my work of quality and of interest for their project could probably just, they'll probably be able to just call me just fine all by themselves. <laughs> they can DM you on Instagram. Um, what is your favorite role ever? Well, I have lots of favorites for lots of different reasons. I mean, of course, you know, everybody that really cares about their craft wants to work with Marty Scorsese and De Niro. I mean, that's a given. That's a real um, 
growth period and an opportunity to learn and become better at your craft. There's no way that you can't want, not I mean, that's it. That's a great thing to want. Um, I love working with Paul Verhoeven because I have a real great shorthand with him. And I think he's a marvelous director and a very intriguing guy who's always ahead of his time. I loved working with Albert Brooks on The Muse because every day <laughs> all we did was laugh all day long. And he's hilarious. Yeah. Like, not just funny when the camera's rolling. He just is that brilliant and funny all day long. And his producer, Herb Nanis, is just a wonderful person. And it was a wonderful set. Um, uh, and uh, I'm now uh, have the opportunity to be Instagram friends with Andy McDowell, which is really fun. Oh, that is fun. I love her. She's, oh. And her daughter is becoming such a marvelous actress. Yeah, so that's just beautiful. I mean, over the years, I've had an opportunity to work with beautiful people. I mean, I worked with Mark Rydell, who directed On Golden Pond. And that's where I met Richard Gere, who I love with all my heart. And, you know, I, I've, I mean, my God, I worked with Rod Steiger. You know, I worked with... Um, George C. Scott. I mean, I've worked with some of the legends in the industry before they passed away. There's just, you know, there's no, you know, I tell people like, you know, when I came to town, a lot of the, the real legends of this industry were still here and still alive. Like Mel Torme came over and was cooking in my kitchen, you know, and you have Mel singing in your kitchen going, hey, kid, throw me the mustard. I mean, these kind of experiences, like that I went on a set and Angie Dickinson was, you know, doing something on the set next door and I got to go meet her, you know, or that Shirley MacLaine had me come out to her house and had dinner and we sat on the floor in front of her fireplace and she talked to me about how the industry worked and you know the only female member of the Rat Pack you know like there's so many experiences that I got to have in my young life as an actor and so many like Faye Dunaway took me to my basic instinct premiere yeah like, who gets to do these things? Do you know what I mean? Who gets to have someone sit down and tell you, you know, don't do what I did. And I'm like, well, what did you do? And she said, you know, I ran off with a rock and roll musician to London <laughs> when I got famous. Don't do that. You know, and like different people, like keeping me on the straight and narrow and Diane Cannon, who jumped up at a Lakers game and said, I'm so happy for your success. Do this, don't do that. And, you know, just great people. Tony Danza, who jumped up in the early time of my career and said, you know, honey, this is the best thing you can do. Don't ever do this. You know, and these great people who just jumped up and gave me little pieces of advice and little pieces of love that were really kind and really thoughtful. These things, you know, Rock Hudson, I did a TV movie with Rock and James Earl Jones when I was a kid, like 24. And, you know, it was a big deal to me to have Rock Hudson wake me up at five o'clock in the morning and tell me have breakfast and I'll teach you how to do your scenes. And then I, you know, go on the floor in Vegas playing a cigarette girl and James Earl Jones is there and rock. And it's like, that's a very big deal for a kid. So all of these wonderful experiences, you know, they really, they add up and they mean something, you know? How would you, before we go, because I know you have to go, but how would you describe sort of where you are right now in your life, Sharon. You're painting, you're writing poetry, you're exploring, I think, these different sides. You're writing, obviously. I have um, a that's on the contemporary charts. Uh, that yeah, oh, that's right, you're recording. Yep. Yeah. Um, I have uh, musical representatives. I have these great guys uh, that are representing me. Uh, I mean, I'm just so... I think lucky, um, but I also think that all the work that I do when I'm not 
working, all the stories that I write and the lyrics that I write and the time I spend at the canvas and, you know, it's about the work. It's about the work. It's about the time you put in at your desk. It's about the time you put in at the canvas. It's about the time you sit down and write. You know, it's not like something that just happens, you know? It's when they call you up and say, you know, do you have lyrics for so-and-so? And I look through, you know, the 200 lists of lyrics that I have and say, yeah, I do, and I have some I can clean up. It's about, do you have something else? Or do you have something you can give to this person that you've written? Well, I have 120 short stories in my computer. You're just so, I mean, it's awesome to, that A, you're so creative and, you know, you're growing every day, doing new things, trying new things, which I think is just so important that, you know, as we are around, you know, taking another circle around the sun, that we can continue to grow and explore and do new things and and actually like uh you know delve into a new side of ourselves and i think it's so exciting and and i think it's so important for other people to hear that because they have a lot of untapped potential no matter what age you are to oh. to 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 have these new adventures no matter if you think, I don't have any idea how to do this. I mean, writing a book, I had no idea how to write a book. Like, not any. And so I, you know, a couple of different people offered me the possibility to write a book. I took the possibility, perhaps not the most lucrative possibility, but the possibility where I would learn the most. I think what we need to do in life is allow people to teach us and allow ourselves to learn and realize that we're never too old to learn. And I'm sure it's scary going through your boxes and figuring out what perspective am I gonna write this uh, memoir from? Yeah. Like you have to pick a perspective. Like your life can be told in t 20 books and it can be told, the first memoir can be told from any perspective. And you have to choose. And just the choosing your perspective is a little bit harrowing. It is, the whole thing. I mean, I, I'd love to talk to you some more offline, as they say, about what Come the on. spirit... I will, I will. We wanted to try to see each other, but COVID was keeping us apart when I was in Los Angeles. I'm very proud to say I'm vaccinated and I'm very grateful to say I'm vaccinated. I feel the same way. I feel the same way. I know that you don't have much time. So I'm just gonna tell everyone that this is Sharon's book. Uh, it's called The Beauty of Living Twice. Um, people are loving it. I'm so happy for you. And you're such a good writer among many other things. So we're gonna have this in my newsletter and wake up call, which, um, I know, Sharon, you read every morning. And um, we'll be sure to um, <laughs> memorialize this on Instagram. And you guys can sign up for the newsletter at katiecurric.com. And I'm really happy to see you, Sharon. I think you're, uh, you, you're beautiful inside and out. You look amazing. Look you make me want to cut my hair all off like yours. But unfortunately, I did that with Winona Ryder. And the lesson I learned, if you don't look like Winona Ryder, do not cut your hair like Winona Ryder. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are so beautiful. You could cut your hair. You could shave your hair. You could look fantastic. Quit it some more, Sharon. Anyway, okay. all right. Love being with you. You could do whatever you want. So just keep being you because we love you so much. And it's such a joy to watch your interviews. And I particularly like when you bring on all these smart political lawyers who can explain to us all the stuff that we couldn't possibly understand without them. Right. I, like the Georgia law, I really appreciated that guy explaining um, what that meant, because as I said, it's it's the world is a confusing place and we need a uh, you know, we need experts and people who are really knowledgeable to give us guidance and help us navigate these crazy really times.
And we need people who are going to stand up at this time and say, that's not okay, or we need this, or please explain that better, or please show us how we can be involved to make it better. Because I think now we're at a point where people are finding their voices and they're finding their peaceful way to say so. And I do not agree with stopping peaceful protests. And I'm horrified that someone wants to pass a law to say that they want to take peaceful protesting away from anyone. Um, so I just want to say, keep going out there, keep protesting, keep standing up for what you believe in and keep doing it peacefully. That's a good note to end things on. All right, Sharon. Bye everyone. Thank you for doing this. Hope to see you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.